welcome you into this Five Clubs conversation, the first one of 2022. From all of us here at Five Clubs, we hope you had a great holiday season and you are ready for 2022. For the PGA Tour, uh, it starts anew. Not the season, but the year. They're at the Century Tournament of Champions. Everybody who is eligible is there with the exception of Rory McIlroy. We'll talk more about that certainly next week and maybe even a prediction before the end of this week as to who is going to win. But, you know, when we were thinking about, you know, who do we want to start the year with, I, I think that you always start every year uh, thinking about the most important figure in the game of golf. And I still believe it. it is Jack Nicklaus. He's going to be 82 years of age in a couple of weeks. He is the all-time major championship winner with 18, not to mention his 73 titles. He has captained every significant international team. He has designed golf courses all over the world. And he is still a very, very active businessman. And what I've always thought about Jack that was underrated is that even when he was still competitive playing golf, he actually was contracted to contribute analysis to ABC. So during their major championship coverage, he would go up in the tower and, and work for like an hour and actually call live golf. And I've always felt that he was as good as anybody talking about the game. And now he's got this enormous view of the game in terms of his interest in the game. He runs one of the most significant golf tournaments annually, the Memorial at his home at Muirfield Village in Dublin, Ohio. So we thought there was only one way to start this year, and that was with Jack Nicklaus. with that, we welcome in Jack Nicholas. Jack, good morning. How are you? Hi, Eric. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's always uh, a pleasure to chat with you about a myriad of subject matter. I got to ask you, you're a couple weeks away from a birthday, and, and not many people, and I say this respectfully, are as in demand a, as you are at the age you are. You're, you're a businessman. Uh, every single day you go to work, and you got a lot going on. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I, I kind of enjoy it. I, you know, I feel I you know, feel good. I, uh, I, you know, I'm my mind's good as far as wanting to do things. And uh, I, I couldn't just see sitting around the house. I, I did enough of that during COVID. And, uh, uh, you know, I guess they, they, they still got to do some of that. But anyway, it's uh, I, I like to be active. I just I, I just enjoy it. You know, one of the things that you're very involved in, and this is not only an intellectual endeavor, uh, it, it's emotional for you, and that is the Healthcare Foundation. Uh, and this is something that I know that you you share uh, very deeply with Barbara. Uh, for you all to, to raise the money that you have, what's next? What What is next for, the, for this that has impacted lives, created life, saved life? Um, after $150 million raised, what now? Well, I suppose next is 200, then 300, and then four, <laughs> 500. You know, we just keep working at it. And, uh, you know, uh, there's never enough money to take care of kids. Uh, there's kids that, and, you know, we're not just uh, local down here in, in, in South Florida. We're, we try to make sure we help kids in, in all parts of the country and the world, frankly. And, uh, you know, we have Nicholas Children's Healthcare Foundation of Canada. And uh, we do, we're doing a lot of work in Canada. And, uh, our hospital, uh, as we saw, you know, the last year or two, we've seen every kids from every state in the union and 119 different countries. So, you know, we're pretty global as it relates to who comes to the hospital and so forth. So, you know, and, 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 and great, a very high percentage of those people can't pay anything. You know? So we're, you know, we started a legacy fund that our, our foundation did in Bob, Barb's of my honor. And, uh, uh, you know, to raise money so that uh, uh, we have, have a fund that throws off an interest that'll take care of uh, all kids who can't pay. And that's what, uh, you know, it's a, it's an ever, it's a never ending. Uh, it's a never ending joy, you might say, because to see what happens with these kids and see how, uh, how it's changed their lives and their parents' lives and, and, uh, uh, it's just, it, it's very rewarding. I mean, I'm, 
I'm obviously long beyond playing golf and, uh, uh, you know, I still, I still doing some golf courses, but, uh, my main focus has been on the foundation and, uh, and that's Barbara supported me for 40 years. And it's, you know, it's my turn and, uh, this is Barbara's patient. So we're having fun with it. And, uh, uh you know, I, I don't want to run a hospital. All I want to do is go raise some money for it. And, and obviously, as I said, y'all have done so much, raised so much. You know, the, the thing that I've always found interesting about your career is that, you know, you did so much so early. So you, you had you got so much recognition. It was and it was deserved because of the accomplishment. I want to ask you about the pivot of the sense of responsibility about using the platform that you had through the game of golf. Did, did something, did a light go on? Uh, did you just inherently feel a sense of responsibility to give back? Well, you know, you know, the tour was uh, 40 years ago. Uh, charity was a part of it, but a very small part of it, Gary. And all of a sudden, the, the, the people figured out that the tour and, and golf was a great way to raise money for, for people. And so uh, that started happening. And we, we all got wrapped up in being able to help different charities. And then Barbara and I have been involved with, uh, uh, you know, Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus so, since the start of the Memorial Tournament. So that's that's over 40 years. And, uh, uh, you know, longer than that, because they, they sort of saved our daughter Nan, Nan's life when she was just 11 months old. And so we always said that if there's any, we were ever in a position to help others, we wanted it to be children. So that's where our focus has been. And then now all of a sudden we, uh, uh, the Honda tournament moves to our area and they're looking for a charity to support. And uh, Fred Millsaps from the foundation came to me and said, are there any children's charities in your area? And I said, I don't know, Barbara. I said, do you want to go for this? And she said, absolutely. So we started our foundation. That's a little over seven, 17 years ago. And, you know, that's when my life totally changed because it was uh uh, it was not about me anymore and what I did and what I, and the things that I did. It was about others and 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 Barbara and making sure that uh, uh, we we were we were we got in that position to be able to help others. So, my gosh, you better use it. You know, you're not there very long. You know, I'm 82 82 years old here in a couple of weeks, and uh, uh, you know, I, you know how you never know how long you're going to be around to be able to to help others. So, we want to do as much of it as we can while we're here. You know, Jack, you mentioned design and, and that for you, you were, you know, you were entering your prime and your prime was long. Uh, and I go back, obviously, to your work with Pete Dye at Harbortown. And in that time, you've designed not only yourself specifically, but also Nicholas Design, over 400 golf courses. You got projects in over 10 countries right now. But I want to focus on two that I find particularly interesting uh, because of the benevolence involved with it, and that is the veterans, uh, American Lake, and, and then also American Dunes. C can you take us through uh, how you got involved first with American Lake in the state of Washington, and then we'll get to the American Dunes project? Well, it started out with uh, Kenny still calling me, and Kenny had played with you know on the tour and played the Ryder Cup together, and he said, Jack, he said we're uh, uh, we need some help out here. We've got a nine hole uh, golf course here at the VA and uh, uh, VA hospital and and and, and uh, it's uh, it's just not enough. We're just we're a chocker block. And he says, "Can you help us?" I said, "Of course I can help you." What what do you want me to do? He says, "Well, we need another nine holes and maybe refresh what we got." And I said, "Sure, I'll be delighted to do that." So we did that, and I got to meet a lot of fellas out there that uh, their lives had changed uh, because of that golf course. And I saw what they did. And I said, you know, this is a very worthwhile project. And so I, I got interested in that. I liked it. And I liked the guys that we, that we met and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the grit that they had to, to be able to continue <clears throat> with what happened. And then, so that we did that and that, that's been going on. Kenny's since passed and uh, uh, the hospital or the golf course is going fine and doing everything. And, uh, we haven't really, I haven't been involved with it for, for several years now, but uh, uh, then uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Rooney came along and he said, uh, uh, Jack, he said, I've been doing some things with Fools of Honor for quite a while. And he said, you know, I'd like to do a golf course. We had a family golf course up in Michigan 
And I like to turn to a three or three, three or one, five or one C three. And uh, he says, I'd like to turn that into a, a, a golf course to honor the uh, <clears throat> veteran, <clears throat> the veterans and folds of honor. I said, and he starts to, he says, can I come down and see you? And he, says, he came down and I said, Dan, I don't know why you wasted the trip. I said, you know, I'm, he says, well, you don't have to try to convince me to do it. He says, I, and when you told me what you wanted me to do, we were in to start with. So <laughs> and we did that golf course. And I think that golf course is, you know, uh, sensational. American do or American lakes is, 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 a, is a pretty much a fundamentally, uh, uh, uh a disabled golf course right. for disabled people, and American uh, American Dunes is more for golfers to raise money for the Fools of Honor, which raises money for education of fallen warriors' children. And so uh, that golf course, I mean, I would go play that golf course every day in the week. It's it is sensational. Uh, they took a piece of property that was totally tree lined, and uh, that's about three hundred yards off of Lake Michigan. So it was total sand underneath. And uh, I said, uh, how did you come up with the name American Dunes? He says, well, I know what's underneath the property. I said, so I said, okay. So we took down about 2,000 big trees. And then Mother Nature turned that, took down about another 500 big trees. And so uh, we took, took we left the perimeter with trees on it to, to sort of soften uh, the development that was around it and left a few pockets of trees in the middle but then start working with sand. And I mean, we had a ball with it. It was good. Chris Cochran did a great job uh, working with me. And uh, we just, uh, uh, you know, we've created a golf course. At the day. And then Barb and I went to the opening and it was, the opening was just very emotional. I mean, I mean, they, you know, we had the fly, go fly over, raise the flag taps, uh, which they do every day. Uh, they have a, a wall of fame that you walk through the, all the fallen warriors or, are honored there. I mean, it's it's pretty sensational, and the the the, uh, the restaurant is a is a is a fighter bomber squadron thing where the guys would be. And they have two airplanes over the top. It was uh, I don't know what I don't know what they called it, but it was uh, where where and they were over Vietnam and uh, uh, one fella is is this other plane uh, ran out of fuel and he came up and lifted up and put his plane under the tail of the other airplane and pushed that airplane over hundred miles out of Vietnam into Laos wow. and everybody was saved. And that was, that that's honored there, right? In, in, in the bar at two, 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 I guess it probably F 16s over the top. I mean, it's, it's sensational and uh, everything that, that Dan Rooney has done there has been, been great. So uh, I'd love being that. Now Dan's talking about wanting to do another one. And so, you know, Hey, I'm in, I, you know, I, I didn't have the opportunity to serve in the military, uh, uh, you know, I was married before they, they wanted to come and get me. And, and so uh, the opportunity to uh, to help the, the, the fellows that are keeping us safe here at home is, uh, is a real privilege and an honor to be able to do so. Yeah, you've said, Jack, you know, I love golf, but I love my country more. And just for people who are unaware, and I know a lot of people who play golf, Folds of Honor has made an enormous impact. They've used the game of golf uh, like you said, to provide all these educational opportunities, over 35,000 scholarships, $160 million of scholarship dollars for children of fallen soldiers. Uh, and I've been out there to Oklahoma with Dan. Uh, it's an enormous undertaking, and it, it really does. I mean, it, it changes lives. It provides opportunities that wouldn't otherwise be there. Uh, and and I, I hope I can have the chance to go out and see this golf course and play it. You know, it, it's interesting. You know, your design. You haven't, had, yeah. you have, you haven't done that yet. What's I mean, that? I can't imagine. I can't imagine what a golf nut that you are. That you haven't <laughs> gone, gone, gone to Grand Haven, Michigan to play that golf course. If you don't get it done this coming season, I'm going to. I'm going to have you and I are going to have issues. All right. I, I, then I'll, it's on my list. It's the beginning of the year. I've got 12 okay. months to get it done. But knowing Michigan's golf season shorter, I better get it done by Labor Day. That's right. All right. Let me, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let me let me ask you about some things that you have always been at the forefront of. Uh, and one is the golf ball. For for basically a half a century, you've said, "Listen, we got to do something with this." And a lot of people just said, you know, they just weren't listening. And now it's been a hot button issue forever. Um, is something going to get done? And why was it that, 
literally five decades ago, you said, this is going to be a problem. It's already becoming a problem. Well, you know, I've talked with both the USJ and the RNA quite a bit about it. And uh, uh, they've told me, they told me that last year, two years ago, they were going to get it done. And COVID sort of stopped them from doing it. And uh, they were said, well, then they think it's going to get done in 2020. Nothing happened. I don't really know what they're doing, Gary. Uh, you know, I've 1970 is the first time I went to the USGA and they, they had a golf ball that was tied us, made one with big dimples, dip, dimples on it. And I said, guys, you know, if, if they can do this and make the golf ball go further, other guys can do it. And with the technology that, that's, that's coming on, you know, they're going to they're gonna make the golf ball go out of sight. Well, that's what they've done. And the USG had RNA haven't controlled it. Uh, not that the USG and RNA aren't good organizations because they're, they're their custodians of the game of golf. And, and we've got to, you know, I think we honor what they do. However, you know, they, they're, they're slow about reacting against this issue because you know, it takes more land. It takes more water. And water is a huge problem, as you know. Uh, it takes more money. It takes it takes more of everything with the golf ball that, get, that keeps going. So uh, if we could get the golf ball to come back, whatever percentage they want, uh, it's uh, whatever it is, it, it's it's a benefit. Uh, they say they put their they put a line in the sand, but that line in the sand seems seems to be getting wider, <laughs> and uh, they keep crossing it. So I I don't I don't really know what's going on. Uh, you know, I, I, they didn't pay any attention to a 30 year old and they're, they're certainly not paying any attention to an 80 year old. So I don't know what they're going to do. But, uh, you know, I, I think in the, for, for all concerned, the golf ball to come back to bring a lot of things back into perspective is very important to the game of golf. And so uh, I'm I'll continue to, to work on it, work with them if they want me to work with them. But uh I think something will get done. It's just how, how long is it going to take them to research the problem? Yeah, you know, you you mentioned water, and it's a it's it's a real issue, and water conservation and and the use of water, uh, not to mention real estate and the cost of building golf courses. Your design business is flourishing. You've got projects all over the world, uh, and where are we going here? I mean, I you know, Mirfield Village. When you opened it in the mid '70s, was a certain yardage, and it's you know golf courses evolve, and you've constantly tried to provide as stern a test as you can for the best players in the world every year. At the Memorial, is your golf course going to be eight thousand yards in ten years? I hope not. I'd have to buy all the houses around it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, the golf course is—I uh, think Mirfield's around seventy-four hundred somewhere right now, and we started out about seventy. 171 and a half. Uh, we've got about as much yardage out of it as I can get. I could get a few more yards, but not they were not important. Uh, what I would hope is the golf ball would come back and then we wouldn't have to use 7,400 yards. We could play the golf course at 71 or 200 yards or whatever it is and play some holes short one day and long another day. We create more variety. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, Augusta National, they had to go buy part of Augusta Country Club to be able to do the things they're doing. And, and there isn't any golf course in the world other than Augusta National that's been financially been able to keep up with what the golf ball does. And even there, even they have trouble with trying to keep up with the golf ball. But it's uh, the game's a wonderful game. It's a wonderful game the way it is, Gary. It's just it's just the cost of, of doing the game. And, 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 and the game used to be uh, a game where the pro and the club champion or, or better pro at a club course could play together and have a game. I mean, there's no way today. I mean, you take uh, uh, Roy McElroy, or I don't care who you take, uh, Dustin Johnson, take him out on a golf course and put him, put him, put him on the back tees of a golf course at 7,200 yards, and the members are playing at 6,500 yards. They're driving it 70, 80 yards past the guy from the back tee. And, you know, I, to playing together and enjoying that together, uh, the, the the club and the pro and the, and the or the, the pro and the, and the club player uh i always thought it was a, a really interesting i used to go play exhibitions and i'd play with a club champion we'd usually play from the back tees we're playing 71 yards i may out hit him by 20 or 30 yards but we had a game 
And on any given day, that club champion could beat me. Uh, there's no chance today with the guys out there, the way they play. And I just think that that's, uh, that's not in the best interest of the game in, in the long term. You know, it, you, the Augusta National thing is interesting because nobody has as rich a history in terms of competing there, but also being a regular member there. You won for the first time in 63. You won for the last time in 86. You finished tied for six in 1998. And over that course of that breadth of time, the golf course changed a lot, yardage-wise. Uh, obviously, the advent at the turn of the century of all the trees and the second cut. Is the golf course less strategic to play than it was 40 years ago? Actually, I think they've done a really good job, Gary. I think they've done a good job of taking the golf course and trying to maintain uh, a standard that was very similar to what we played back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, I mean, it's a different golf course. I mean, it's considerably longer and it's got different shots, but the, rel the relativity to that, to the two, pretty much is, is very similar. They've done a really good job of that. Uh, they've taken the golf golf ball and the golf clubs into, into consideration. And, uh, you know, the bunker at number one, uh, let's just assume that they haven't moved it, which they have. But the, the relativity to, 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 to a tee shot still is there. You could really hit a big ball. It might get over it or you play out just the left of it. When we were playing 40 yards up, you might get over it. You might play just left. Tee shot's the same. The bunker on number two, they might be able to get over it or they might have to play the left of it. It's the same as we had. We might have been able to play up it, but, but you know, golf ball going in. So all those things are pretty relative to what are pretty similar. And they've done a great job of that. I, I, you know, I give, them, give them kudos for that. And, uh, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's not their problem. It's the game's problem. We've got a, you know, Augusta National is a leader in it, but we need to, uh, uh, we need to fix it within the game and, and fix it for all. You know, you mentioned a couple of players, and and for those folks who are unaware, a Bears Club is home to a lot of the best players in the world. And and you were telling me this years ago that you know these guys are members. I mean, they have skin in the game. Uh, you know, they contribute. They just don't come and hit balls and and be recluses. They participate. They they interface with with the other members at the club. And with that, you spend a reasonable amount of time with these guys, being around them. They'll have lunch with you. Is there a theme to what these guys ask you? Do they appeal to you for advice? And if they do, what do they ask of you? Well, sometimes they do. We, sometimes we just sit and talk. Uh, I saw Roy yesterday. Uh, we talked for a minute. I saw Matthew Fitz Fitzpatrick. And we just said hello. Uh, you know, every once in a while, we'll, uh, you know, Roy was there uh, uh, with his instructor, uh, Michael, help me with the last name. Bannon. And Michael Bannon. Yep. And uh, uh, he was there with Michael and I, and we talked about, you know, a, a statement he made after he won, you know, he says, he said, I finally got tired of trying to uh, hit the ball where somebody else hit it. I don't start playing my game and playing where I could play. And I said, I said, hey, man, I said, we and I've been talking about that for a long time. And I said, he said, he said, yeah, we have. And I said, well, you know, those are the kind of things we talk, little stuff. I don't, I don't really get involved with their stuff. I don't interfere with how, what they do unless they ask me and want some help. And every once in a while, one of them will say, you know, Jack, take a look at this. What do you see? I'm happy to do that. Uh, but for the most part, uh, it's really sit down and uh, help them strategically on, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I got a kick out of Trevor Emblem came to me right before he won the Masters and asked me how to play Augusta. And he won. Then Charles Schwartzel came to me <laughs> and asked me how do I play Augusta. And I told him, and he won. Now, you know, I, I said, you know, I, I didn't think I was that good to be able to do that. But, you know, <laughs> I do know how to play the golf course. I can impart some some uh, uh, wisdom of how, how to do it and what you should do and, and how, you, how, how you go about playing but, you know, you still got to play the shots themselves. Each one of those guys played those shots and won the golf tournament. Uh, they were just, I guess, smart enough to get a little additional information that would help them play well. So, I, you know, and I'm very flattered by that because that's uh, something that uh, uh, I enjoy doing. I enjoy being part of it. I, I don't want to intrude on them, and, and, uh, but I'd also, I also, I'm available. You know, Jack, I've always theorized that, that you would have won more uh, if and you won 73 times, but you were very particular. You wanted balance in your life. 
Um, but, but the reason I say that is that analytics has become an enormous part of the game. And, and players use a lot of data in their preparation. And you were at the forefront of this with respect to, you know, valuing numbers and, and yardage books and very, being very precise. Have you thought about if, if you were in this day and age that you would have thrived even more because you were somebody who, who really took time to, to understand the analytical part of approaching playing competitive well, golf? I didn't really want to but to be too analytical, Gary. I think that uh, I think you go, go a little beyond uh, with reason. I mean, the game of golf is a game and it's supposed to be fun and it's supposed to be not played with a book in your hand and the book tell you how to play. Uh, I think that it's, it's, I was the first one on the tour to have a yardage book. I walked, I walked off my golf courses and I did that uh, in, uh, in 1961 in the National Amateur at Pebble Beach. Dean Beeman got me to do it. And I walked it off and I played every round under par. And I said, really? I said, Pebble Beach is a tough golf course. And so I took that to the tour and the guys sort of poo-pooed and laughed at me. But when they found out I always had the right yardage, they stopped <laughs> laughing at me and they started doing a little bit themselves. And, uh, uh, but that's as far as I ever took it. I, I mean, to, to, to get the greens and put this, plot out the greens and do all that stuff. I mean, that's, that's a little too much. Uh, I mean, if you can't figure out that the, the water drains from a high spot to a low spot and the, the, the grass, generally speaking, will go to the setting sun in Bermuda or the drainage with the, with bent. Or, and if you can't figure those things out, you know, you haven't really put, spent much time trying to understand what, what things do around you. And uh, you get too analytical, then all of a sudden you think that take, it takes, a, to me, it takes the fun out of the game. Uh, uh, I think it's nice that they put yardages, generally speaking, on sprinkler edge they have for quite a while now. Uh, and if you get that, it gives you approximation. I mean, the average golfer that goes out there and plays, I mean, it says it's 150 yards. He has no idea whether to hit a four iron or a nine iron or he doesn't have any idea which either whether the club will go 130 or 180. And most of them don't have any idea. They're guessing. And so they got to try to guess the best they can. And I think that's okay. It's part of learning how to play the game. Uh, now the pros, you know, is this, if you want to know it's 153 yards and you know what, you, what the conditions are, you know, I think in your head, you can figure that out. You don't need, I, I mean, and to me, I never liked, I mean, I think the caddies spend, spend, play a, a, a big role for the guys today because uh, they get a lot of information for them, but I wanted to do it, figure it out myself. And I didn't want, I never had, I never had a caddy help me pull a club out of the bag. I mean, I pulled my own clubs out of the bag, played the clubs I wanted to play. And, uh, uh, you know, for the most part, other than Jackie and Steve, I never asked a caddy to help read a green. So I mean, I, I did all that myself. I, and I think I did more with the boys, more out of courtesy, but I knew that they both were good players so they could, they, they knew how to do it. So, uh, you know, but like, it's just like this, but I made it the 17th of August in, in, in 86. Mm -hmm. Jackie and I look back at the putt and the putt was from the left side of the, the middle left of the green to the right side of the green. And I looked at the putt and Jackie says, it's going to go right. And I said, yeah, I said, it's going to go right. But I think it'll straighten back out with Ray, the, the influence from Ray's Creek. And he says, are you sure? And Jackie is, I says, I think so. And I think that's what it's going to do. So, I mean, that's the kind of input I got from Jack. And so I played it just left of the cup. The ball broke out, broke right, then straightened back out, went in the cup. And of course I won the masters, but you know, it, it was, it was my, my reading it was, it, I got information from him, from Jackie, but I, but I still had to play the shot and I still had to play the shot the way I thought the shot should be played. And I think guys, guys today have so much information that I'm not sure that they, they, they know how to play the shot themselves. And that's what I worry about growing the growing growing the game themselves tiger was terrific at, at doing i mean tiger got information but i don't think tiger uh, muddied up the situation with information i think he went in he was he, his dad was very sharp in in teaching tiger in that uh he taught him how to take the old golf clubs and how to take the old golf balls and how to maneuver them and should play shots and do different things and as you know Tiger can do about anything he wants to with a golf ball. And 
uh, you know, I give his dad a lot of kudos for that. And, uh, and Tiger, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he's, uh, he's, he, he's learned and paid attention and he's responsible for his own game. I mean, every touch of a while, Tiger goes out and takes a lesson. I mean, he went one pebble beach at the U S open, but what, 20 shots. And then the next day he goes out and changes teachers. I mean, I didn't understand that one, but you know, you know, that, that's what he did, but it's, uh, uh, for the most part, uh, I think Tiger's pretty much been responsible for his own game. And I think that's, uh, that's what I try to do. I went to Jack Grout maybe two or three times yep. a year for about an hour. And, and, and that, that was all we did. And that, that's all I needed. And, uh, Jack went to hundreds of golf tournaments, but he never, ever stepped one foot on the practice tee. And if I didn't had a question, I'd go back and ask him a question, but I'd say I probably did that. If he went to a hundred golf tournaments, I may be asking five questions in a hundred golf tournaments. And, uh, uh, for the most part, I, you know, I'll, if you, if you, and that's what Bobby Jones said to me, that he said he became a golfer when he stopped running back to Sterling Maiden, who was mm. his teacher yep. for help. And he said, when I started being able to make my own decisions, my own corrections and do it on the golf course, that's when I became a golfer. And that's what Jack Grout tried to teach me. And Grout taught me that way. And that's the way I played. And I think that the more you're responsible for your own game, the better, the better chance you have of being a better golfer. Yeah, you always told me that with Jack, it was very fundamental stuff that you would go back uh, and work on with him. And it's interesting to note about Tiger that, you know, these, these wins that he's got later in his career, he has taken ownership of his golf swing. He's not leaning on an on instructor when he won at East Lake and when he won in Japan and when he won the Masters in 2019. Um, he was leaning on, on himself. I, I got to ask you, because he's now 46. Uh, he's the age you were when you won the Masters for the last time. If he won the Masters this year at the same age, would it equal the accomplishment that you had at the same age? Would it eclipse I it, would, it? I think it would eclipse it. I think it, for him physically to come back and to win uh, a Masters this year, it would be absolutely fantastic. I don't think I think I don't think the ages are comparable because today I think for, forty six when I won is today's fifty one or two. Uh, uh, so, but but he, so at forty six today he back when I was about 40, maybe. Right. And so, uh, but I mean, for him to come back after what he's gone through and to win, win again, you know, my hat would go off to him big time. And I would imagine, I, I mean, I look, nobody knows, but I, my intuition tells me he's going to play golf this year. Do you feel the same way? We, we don't have any knowledge, but you believe he's going to play. Yeah, I have not talked to him at all, and, and I believe he's going to play when he can play and how, you know, how much he can play, how much he can walk. Uh, I mean, I watched him with the father son a little bit. He walks 10 times better than I walk. <laughs> for, some, yeah, for some almost 82, but that's beside the point. He, he walks a lot better than I do, but uh, he, uh, uh, he'll figure it out. I mean, that, that's, that's what he's always done. And uh, uh, that's what, that's what champions do. And he's a champion. Let me ask you a couple things about the pro game. Um, I, I asked you a question in the media center at, at uh, the Masters five years ago about social media. And, and you participate and you have, you know, people who help you with with, you know, putting stuff out and, and distributing and distributing thoughts. But if you were in your prime, would you participate in social media? If I was in my prime today, uh, I think probably I would participate to some degree because that's what everybody does. But uh you know, I, I think social media is a, is a big distraction to a lot of things, but also it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a place where you can put out your message and get your, get your point across and, and talk about things that you can, that you didn't have the opportunity to do 40 years ago. The, uh, the written word, you've always valued it, whether it was Jim Murray or whether it was Furman Bisher, Dan Jenkins. Um, and, and famously, what was written about you in advance of the 86 Masters, um, did you always have Barbara kind of filter everything that, that might have been written? I mean, you, it was rarely anything that was uh, said in the negative, but did you have her as a filter with respect to things that might have been said or written? Well, I want, I want to tell you a little story. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I hope, I hope Greg doesn't, Norman doesn't have objection to this, but 
but uh, uh, Laura, when they were, he was married to Laura, he, yeah. he, Laura called Barbara and she says, Barbara, she said, there's this pa- article written about Greg in the paper this morning. And it was, and it, it was not a very nice article. I, I don't know what his reaction is going to be when he sees it. And Barbara looked at her and she said, why would you ever let him see it? Mm. Barbara, if there's any article in, in, in things, <laughs> Barbara, Barbara made sure it got buried someplace so I never saw it. <laughs> and you know, why would I do it? I mean, I mean, let's. I mean, in today's world, uh, uh, you know, I wrote that letter before, during the, before the election about Trump, and uh, you know, I mean, I it was, it was a letter that I, you know, I supported the things that he had done. Right. And I mean, uh, I've got. Lots of really, really nice commentary. I must have gotten thousands of people that were, you know, were mad at me. I never saw one of them. Mm. I mean, my wife and, and Scott and my assistant, Rose Garrido, they all kept me out of it. I ne- I've never seen one. So to me, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm still focused on doing what I want to do. And I mean, I use that example because it's a modern day. But uh, back in the old days, when Barbara had, I mean, very rarely. I mean, the, the, the Tom McAllister article that you referred to earlier, yes. put on my uh, refrigerator at, uh, at Augusta, that was John Montgomery, great, great friend yep. for years. And uh, you know, that was more of a joke than anything else. That wasn't a, that wasn't a bad article. Tom was, Tom was having fun with it, but it was, uh, uh, you know, clubs are rusty, he's done, he's finished, and all that kind of stuff. And they got, John got a kick out of it because, the truth was I was, but, uh, you know, he wanted to make sure that, uh, uh, he, he got my dander up a little bit to go play. <laughs> I, l- last thing about, about the pro game, the money, and, and these guys are making, you know, a, a, a ton of money. Um, do, do you think that, that money can affect performance as far as motivation and drive and desire? Absolutely. I don't think it's any question. I think it's been, I think for the last 20 years, it's been affecting it. I mean, you get guys that uh, when Tiger was playing in his prime and you got another guy who was maybe second, third, fourth, fifth on the money list, winning half as much as Tiger. And he'd sit there and he'd say, well, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to put that much work into it and be able to make, I probably can't get there anyway. Uh, he says, I can, he says, I'm making a great living. And he says, I can live a great life. I can go play. I, I'm not bothered by a lot of people. And he says, you know, if I work that much harder, I just get, I just, I won't get there, and I, and I don't need that anyway. Well, there's a lot of guys that think that way. Uh, I don't think that, you know, certainly Tiger didn't ever think that way. I don't think Rory thinks that way. Uh, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, some of the other young guys would think. Oh, I don't think Jordan Spieth would think that way. No, I don't think John Rahm thinks that way. Um, John Rahm wouldn't think that way. No, but I think that the, the point of it is that there are a lot of guys who who are quite happy being just in second, second, third place, making three or $4 million a year and living, a, living a, a comfortable life. Uh, you know, I couldn't do that. Tiger couldn't do that. And as you say, John Rahm, I don't think could do that. Uh, but you know, uh, I do think that, 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 that the money today affects what they do. Uh, and I look at, uh, I look at some of the money and some of the tournaments and some of the, some of the guys that skip things. Yes, I'm they skip like World a, Golf Championships, Jack. Oh, they, have, they don't even have cuts. And I'm saying, wow, well, look at this. I'm good, gracious. And if we ever got a, you know, my first year on tour, Gary, I don't know what the total purse was, but we played our first hundred thousand dollar tournament, and I think we had nine tournaments on the tour that year that were fifty thousand, and, and we had eight of them, and then one was a hundred. And I think most of the tournaments were $20,000 tournaments, which was a $2,800 first prize. I mean, $2,800 for first, first prize wouldn't even get the guys to the tournament today. You know, I mean, they would, they, their airfare or the hotel would cost more than that. And so, uh, and the guys wouldn't come to the British Open because you had to finish the top three to, to, to make expenses for the week. I understand all that. Uh, I didn't play golf for that. I played golf because I wanted to play in the British Open because I thought it was something that you should have on your resume. And it's a great tournament. It's a great tournament to win. Uh, I played golf for the game of golf, not for money. 
And uh, so, uh, sure, the prizes increased, increased. They proportionally the the prizes have increased. You know, if you take the cost of living or whatever you want to take, I mean, golf golf purses have outstripped the cost of living by a hundred times or a thousand times. So I don't I don't know really what that is, but it's it's a uh, it's a lot. And uh, you know, all I I, I I give them all credit. I think I think uh, Tim Fincham and then uh, Jay Monahan have done a great job with the with the tour. The raising the purses, getting where they're going. Jay's doing a great job now of, of uh, trying to make bring bring together some of the European tour, bring people together, and do some things that are we hadn't done before. I think the game of golf tournament wise is in great shape. Uh, they're playing for a lot of money, but you know I think guess that uh, uh, that's what that's what the traffic will bear. That's what they're they're going to do. So that's good. Jack, a couple last things. I, I've always marveled at the fact that you you never seem to need golf. And I remember one of the last times that, that you, Gary, Lee, and, and Arnold were together, I just was lucky enough to be there. And Gary pointed out that 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 Trevino and Palmer loved golf more than, than you and Gary. It doesn't mean that you didn't love it, but it was almost like they couldn't live without it. Um, why do you think that was? I mean, because you had such balance as a kid and you played all sports. I don't, I don't, I don't think player could live without it either. <laughs> Gary, Gary plays every day. And if you would give Gary a handicap today, Gary would be a plus two or three. Wow. I mean, he can, he's 86 years old and he can really play. Trevino, he can still really play. And, you know, but, you know, Arnold, there wasn't anything else but golf for Arnold. Arnold just loved being on the golf course every day. Trevino goes every day. Gary goes maybe six times a week. You know, I played twice this year or last year. Right. And, and, I, and I, I love game of golf, but I can't play it anymore. And, you know, maybe if I would played more, I, I would still be able to play. But, you know, my body is such that it doesn't, doesn't like me anymore. And so... <laughs> I just accept it. And I got a lot of other things I'm doing. It doesn't have to be on the golf course. It can be about golf and related to, uh, I mean, like doing golf courses or doing, doing raising money for the foundation, uh, uh, you know, or, or just doing things like we're doing right here today. Uh, I love talking to the guys and, 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 you know, you're still interested. Yeah. I'm 82 years old. You're still interested in what my opinion is. Uh, so, you know, I enjoy that. I'm flattered by that. And so uh, uh, those are things that, that I can do. I don't have to go out and hit a golf ball. I've, I've done enough of that. But uh, the, the other guys, they just love to go out and hit golf balls. And I, you know, I, I, I didn't hit golf. When I was in my prime, I would, you know, I, I tried to figure out a time when I could get away to go fishing or just go to spend time with the, with the kids doing things. I mean, I, I was pretty balanced my whole life. I was I was blessed to be able to do that. I give Barbara obviously a lot of credit for that because Barbara sort of, you know, kept me on the straight and narrow as far as uh, making sure that my kids knew me. She and she and she did it in two ways. One, she made sure I knew them. But she also made sure that the kids knew me. And so, you know, that that was important. And I mean, I've got uh, four of the five kids live right around here. Yeah, they're here all the time. Uh, Michael's. Uh, in Atlanta, but Michael's business is down here. He's down here a, a lot, so I still see him a lot. But, you know, uh, I still got a great relationship with my kids and my family. We have 22 grandkids and two great grandkids now, the third one on the way. Uh, you know, and, 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 and just watching a little, little, little Harry and little Chris, which are the two great grandkids, <laughs> you know. It's, you know, it's, it's starting over again. Here we go. No question. But I, I got to ask you about Arnold. It's been five years. Um, what do you miss? I miss my friendship with him. You know, Arnold and I, we kidded each other like you unmercifully. You know, <laughs> if there was ever an opportunity to needle the other one, well, we'd pick up the phone or whatever it was and give each other a call. I mean, I talked to him a couple of weeks before he passed. And I said, AP, hey, how you doing? He says, he says, I am doing great. He says, my body is feeling so good. He says, I'm going out. He says, I, I, I plan on going out to the golf course this afternoon, hit some balls. And he says, I think I'm going to get back into playing again. Mm. He was lying to me like, you know, 
but he but he wouldn't he wouldn't let me get the satisfaction of that of again getting needle me. You know, that's the way we were. You know, we would we would we but if one of us shot 75 on a golf course and 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 and, and Arnold or Gary and I would be waiting at his locker when he came in. Hey, Arn, where did you get all your birdies today? Man, I said, you know, what a great round you played. You know? <laughs> and, and, and he, you know, he'd get, he'd get mad and then he'd laugh. And we, we'd, we'd have a great time. We did a lot of things. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just miss his company. And I miss, uh, uh, you know, Arnold took great care of me. I was eight, 10 years younger than Arnold. And uh, when I started on tour, he, uh, he made sure that this young guy uh, had a fair shake. And uh, uh, I really appreciated that. I'll never forget it. I, I mean, I even remember when, when Winnie passed in it, and we had, we were up in La Trobe for Winnie's memorial service and Gary was at Q school. That's right. And so, I mean, I wanted to be down watching Gary play his last round at Q school and Arnold, Arnold came over to me at, during the, the uh, after party and said, hey, is, uh, is Gary playing today? And I said, yeah. He says, let's go watch it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, he, he, he always had, he knew, knew the right thing to do. So we went over and the two of us watched Gary finish up and qualify for the tour. So, I mean, it was, that, was, that was what Arnold did. He was very special to a lot of people. He was very special to me. Well, I, I've, I think I've told you this. I've never shared this story publicly. You were kind enough to give me a ride home from the Greenbrier, and this was in 2015. And I was sitting on the bench of your plane, and, and you and Arnold were facing each other. You were giving him a ride home. His plane was getting serviced. You were going to drop down in Atlanta. You and Barbara were going to get off and spend the weekend at Michael's house. So I'm looking at you two, and it's like looking at Churchill and, and FDR. And I'm thinking, <laughs> look, and, and, and we, we land in Atlanta. You pulled him in close, had a little tender moment, and you and Barbara got off the plane. And the, 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 the pilot was standing right outside of the cockpit, and you had left the plane, and Arnold said to him, what's the flight time to Orlando? And the pilot said, 43 minutes. And without missing a beat, he turned to me and he said, my plane would do it in 39. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would, that would be our own. <laughs> <laughs> it was one That's of the great, great moments. Oh, yeah, that would be terrific. All right, let me let you go on this. Five quick questions, uh, and I know you're going to have answers for all of these. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? Uh, probably butter pecan. Okay. Uh, your favorite non-golf sporting event? Uh, Wimbledon. I, th- I was going to say it had to be that or an Ohio State-Michigan game, maybe. All right. Did you have it's a... Right, it's right in there. Not, not this year. No. Or this last year. No. Normally, ex- normally, normally the previous few years, yes. Exactly. Did you have a celebrity crush growing up? I mean, like on a movie star or somebody? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, not really. I mean, I I go back right now, and I and I, I turn on the Turner Classic Movies. Yes. And every once in a while, I get a movie on somebody where they had Natalie Wood or yes, uh, or uh, Janet Lee or one of those. And I say, wow, were they pretty girls? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, those are kind of the kind of the, I suppose the kind of questions you might have. Uh, you know, but it's uh. uh I never really, I, I was too busy. Yeah. Uh, I was too busy from the time I got married when we were 20. Yeah. From that time on, boy, I was, I was, I had my nose to the grindstone trying to play golf. Yep. Uh, I, I give you a historic person, alive or dead, you can have dinner with. Who would it be? Um, I would think maybe Churchill. Mm. I think he, what an amazing, amazing man he was. Amazing life, amazing. Yeah, I mean, the, the world would be very different without him and, and FDR doing what they did. All right, last thing. What's your favorite, what was your favorite cuss word or phrase on the golf course? <laughs> well, I never, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you that. Yeah, um, you can. Every once in a while, what, what I would do out loud is, oh, Jack. <laughs> That's about as far as I wanted to go. Now, yeah. under, underneath my voice, I might say a few other things. But, oh, Jack is, 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 is the loudest thing that would come out of my mouth. 
Well, listen, it's always, you know how much I value your time. It's great to chat with you. Please give my best to Barbara. Thank you so much. Okay, Gary. Same same thing. We get your family and uh, Barbara sends her best. And we'll look forward to seeing you along the road. Thanks Appreciate so much. It. Okay, my friend. Well, we thank Jack. I, I said it to him. Uh, and I'll repeat it. I have always valued his time. I've been very fortunate uh, to have the chance to, to, to interface with him and, and talk to him about a lot of stuff. And I always find it interesting. I always learn something. But today, maybe for the first time, he learned something from me because the Palmer story, I thought maybe I had shared it with him, but the way he laughed, I feel like maybe he'd never heard that before. So we certainly thank him. We thank you. And a reminder that it's not just going to be me this year. Uh, stay tuned for all the additions to the Five Clubs family because you're going to hear more voices, more perspectives, more viewpoints on the game that we all love, and that is the game of golf. So for now, we say goodbye. We'll see you next time on the Five Clubs Conversation. 